I was asked to speak on uh, a new New Deal and um, I'll probably recapitulate uh, things that people have been here for the first uh, couple of sessions have said, but I guess since I'm the last speaker in the series, I get to, uh, I get to do that. Uh, so first, you know, the original New Deal. Well, of course, uh, it uh, uh, took place in the US under the presidency of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It represented a break with a failed market, market orthodoxy of, of leaving things to business. The uh, Republicans who'd been running uh, the US ever since World War I had failed miserably. Uh, the country was in a Great Depression and uh, Roosevelt stepped in with a wide range of interventions that have shaped US policy in large measure ever since. Uh, while this is uh, a specifically US story, uh, the same things were happening elsewhere around the world and in particular in Australia. If you want, I guess, the equivalent phrase, the New Deal, it's, it's Chifley's Light on the Hill and, and his speech, which is certainly well worth reading. More generally, across the developed world, in this post-war period, we had what was called the social democratic moment. And um, that um, uh, had a number of key features. First, uh, for the first and perhaps uh, the only time so far in history, a commitment to full employment. So until this time, we had had the assumption that the labour market did what it did and people had to put up with, uh, people had to put up with the outcomes. Uh, second, a combination of income redistribution and what's been called pre-distribution, that is equalising uh, the kinds of incomes that people take out of the market, uh, not leaving that up to the market and trying to redistribute the proceeds. Uh, the big element, particularly in the US, but uh, where, where it was something quite new, but uh, developing in strength everywhere, was, uh, was trade unionism. So in the US, unions were almost insignificant and struggling before the New Deal, they became a part of the landscape through the 1950s and 1960s. In all countries, uh, the position of trade unions was greatly enhanced. The result was a huge compression in uh, market incomes, that is in wage incomes between the highest and lowest income earners and between wages and, and profits. Uh, a mixed economy, that is a combination of, of public provision of goods and services uh, through both uh, health and education, but also in the various nationalised industries which uh, we've seen privatised in recent decades, and uh, the welfare state. Uh, again, um, uh, not entirely new, depending on where you were. In the US, uh, nearly all of it, Social Security, uh, the, the healthcare system such as it is, emerged under the New Deal. Uh, in Australia and other countries, we already had things like the old age pension, but these things were greatly enhanced in this period. Uh, so what were the successes? Well, decades of full employment, strong economic growth and social equality, unparalleled either before or since. Uh, uh, during this period, of course, uh, a contest with, uh, with the Soviet Union and, and communism, uh, the advocates of, of, the, of social democracy were able to point to a society which was pretty much equal, which had delivered the kind of equality which communism promised with only a handful of, of wealthy people who had a relatively small share of income and another relatively small handful of, of people who were poor. Uh, these could be seen as the exceptions to a society which was almost universally uh, middle class or prosperous working class. Um, and it paved the way for a bunch of future developments. During the, during the 50s, we had a fairly a conservative society emerging from this period, but in the 60s, with full employment, we saw the emergence of environmentalism, uh, feminism, uh, equal rights in the US, a range of social forces which were unleashed in large measure because, uh, because of the power that was created when people weren't frightened of unemployment, when they didn't have to depend on the will of the rich and powerful. What were the limitations? Well, first, the model was very much tied to uh, a nuclear family with a single male breadwinner. That was the kind of model in which, uh, in which uh, uh, the system was designed to work well, well for, to make sure that uh, there was full employment for men who could go out and work and earn a living to support their family. And uh, in addition, it was tied to an industrial economy, an economy in which manufacturing uh, was really at the centre of things. This was the high point of manufacturing employment in the history of in the history of the industry in the history of modern society, uh, growing steadily at the expense of agriculture, which which diminished to trivial levels in this period, before the huge rise of services and then the information economy. Uh, this uh, system 
ran into a bunch of difficulties I can't talk about in detail in the 1970s, and what we saw then was the rise of neoliberalism. And as we've heard, we can use it as a catch-all for everything we don't like about the current society, but it is in fact a coherent ideology, a revival of the market orthodoxy of the past, but with answers, critiques of the social democratic uh, alternative it was replacing, and with a huge dependence on uh, the power and good judgment of financial markets. Uh, the key elements um, uh, included um, uh, privatisation, uh, attacks on unions, which have been highly successful. Uh, union membership has declined to very low levels in, in Australia and, and in, in many other countries. Uh, rolling back the state, rather less successful. One of the striking features of neoliberalism has been its very limited success in wiping out the welfare state. We still have most of the key institutions of the welfare state, certainly under attack, but nothing like what the uh, fans of Margaret Thatcher were hoping for when they, when they came to power in the early 1980s. Uh, and, um, but uh, nonetheless, its success in shifting a good deal of risk away from business and from governments and onto ordinary people. And of course, a highly regressive redistribution of income and wealth. We've seen the top 1% of the income of, of households uh, rising to 25% of all income in the US. So whereas you used to be able to draw this picture where all the money was really distributed in the middle, there were a handful of, of quite wealthy people who didn't really count for very much, now a very large and increasing share of income going to the very wealthy and we're seeing this emerging at greater or lesser speed throughout the developed world. So we've also seen, of course, this system fail to deliver on its promises. So, uh, so as of until 10 years ago, until the time of the global financial crisis, the problem was that it didn't matter that the rich were getting richer because everybody was getting richer. Uh, we were promised a century of unprecedented economic growth, uh, stability and so forth. Of course, uh, none of that has happened. Even bodies like the OECD are now saying the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, inequality and financialisation are contributing to the economic stagnation that we see throughout the, uh, throughout the developed world. So uh, that was the background. Now, now what, can we, what can be done? What is the new New Deal? Well, first, uh, as was mentioned, it can't be just uh, the old New Deal revived, but there are some big elements that we need to go back to. A, a radical restructuring of labour law, removing essentially the vast majority of, of so-called reforms that have been introduced in the past 30 years, virtually all of which have weakened the position of trade unions, which in turn has been reflected, of course, as would be predicted and as was wanted, in lower wages and worse working conditions. The idea put forward under neoliberalism that workers would benefit by being able to bargain directly with their employers uh, has now been abandoned even as a pretense. Uh, the employers are openly saying, of course, you can't expect jobs anymore. Uh, we now have the gig economy and you'll turn up as and when we need you and leave, uh, leave without pay at the moment we don't need you. Uh, that's, uh, other, and uh, so those two things and return to public ownership, I think these are elements of the old, of the old New Deal that we need to revive. Uh, but we need to, um, we need to recognise that much has changed since the 1970s. First, I think, uh, having said, having looked at these features of, unemploy uh, of, of the labour market, it doesn't seem likely that even with these changes we can restore the kind, kind of full employment that prevailed in the 50s and 60s. Uh, whether because the erosion of those patterns has been too much or whether because the economy has indeed changed fundamentally, I don't think we can look at trying to recreate lifetime, lifetime full employment of the kind that was taken uh, as the goal in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and um, uh, the second, uh, the replacement of the industrial economy by the information economy is a fact, is, only, is not going to be reversed. Uh, it's certainly created plenty of disruption as well as plenty of benefits, and we've seen that. Hutch described uh, the kinds of costs that that shift has created, but it's not a shift that's going to be replaced. If we look at manufacturing, it's not the case that our manufacturing jobs have gone to China or somewhere else. Employment in manufacturing in China is declining, and again, not because there are still places where it's growing, places that are behind the curve, but for the world as a whole, manufacturing employment has passed its peak some time ago. We're never going to see that change because we can't reverse the technological shifts of the, of the past century. The other thing that's happened has been uh, a change away from uh, the relatively 
uh, one-size-fits-all model of the life course that we had where everybody was essentially in couple families with children to much more complicated, uh, much more complicated and diverse patterns of life. Uh, that has big implications for the kinds of welfare state we can construct. I don't think I'll quite get to that too much in, in time. So what do we need for new measures to respond to this? Well, the first, I think, is that while we need to uh, pay attention to jobs, uh, ultimately trying to say we're going to create jobs is not the right answer. We really need to break uh, dependence on the labour market uh, uh, of the kind that essentially hands power to employers. That means, in the first instance, measures job measures like a public job, job guarantee. We need to say we don't need to rely on the employer class to provide jobs. Uh, we need the government to step up and fill that place. But it also means we need to go beyond uh, go beyond the notion of a job as somewhere where you produce a bunch of physical objects. You, the, the, the value of those physical objects is divided between labour and capital uh, and that's, that's the bargain. In the information economy, these kinds of concepts no longer uh, make a great deal of sense. Uh, so we need, I think, to look beyond a job guarantee to issues like universal basic income and to participation income. That is, in, in place of uh, the continuous attacks on the unemployed, saying we need to do, get them doing make work jobs of, of various kinds. We need to expand the notion of what constitutes a social contribution to include volunteering and activities of that kind. The ultimate goal would be a genuinely unconditional income. That's a long, long way in the future. But I think we need to avoid, uh, we need to start avoiding the kind of jobs based rhetoric that takes us back to. Uh, takes us back to the last century, uh, because that economy, I think, is not going to return. Uh, looking at the information economy, uh, it poses great opportunities as well, as well as risks. Crucially, information is the ultimate public good. That is, uh, the information I'm presenting to you now uh, can be taken by somebody else and presented, presented elsewhere at no cost. It isn't a physical good that has to be divided up. And this is something which essentially markets ultimately are not appropriate for. An economy in which a society in which information is the main is the main game is not one in which we need wages, prices and incentives to be tightly matched to, uh, uh, to what is produced and, and indeed we're already seeing that that's the case. That if we look at who's got rich out of the information economy it's people who have access to particular choke points in it, not the people who actually produce the information. No one got rich out of Wikipedia. Google gets rich because it can search what everybody else has done and serve it up to us with, uh, serve it up to us, uh, with ads. That in turn means that uh, the case for a large financial sector allocating capital to its most profitable use has really already ceased to exist. There's no close correlation between profits and social contribution and therefore uh, no benefit in, no social benefit in finding the next Google uh, whether, it's a, whether it's Snapchat or some similar enterprise, the real value is being contributed by the people who create content, which is all of us, uh, and, uh, and not by the people who are managing to collect tolls along the way. Uh, that in turn brings us to the uh, a central part of the struggle over attempts to promote strong notions of intellectual property. Uh, that, of course, has been part of a general shift towards monopolisation that we've seen arising from neoliberalism, uh, which is entirely obsolete and antithetical to the interests of, of society. And indeed, uh, even the more useful sections of the information economy recognise intellectual property is, is simply an unnecessary monopoly which is being extracted uh, and uh, more is spent in protecting intellectual monopoly and extracting these monopoly profits than is, guaranteed, than is actually generated by society. So that brings us to uh, the role of the, role of the public sector, a renewed role for research, education uh, and, and other human services, and you know, certainly a central importance of education, which we've seen uh, suffering in all countries, but certainly in Australia, under uh, marketisation and neoliberalism, uh, particularly in this context, vocational education has been, has been a disaster area, as, as every day's uh, newspapers reveal. I, I was just reading yet another one of another horror story emerging, I think, from the so-called post-reform phase of vocational education. We need to, um, 
we need to return to a strong public sector role in education, uh, eliminate for-profit education and expand, uh, expand particularly I think uh, vocational education. That's the area where, where people are mostly mo more missing out than higher education so-called that attracts most of the attention. So to sum up, I think we are, we are seeing uh, in the debate ideas which were once unthinkable suddenly becoming thinkable. Some of those ideas should have remained unthinkable. Uh, you know, Pauline Hanson is certainly getting uh, a treatment, a respectful treatment that she didn't get 15 years ago for, for, for racist attacks. She's now treated as a legitimate player uh, when, when in the past she was treated as politically toxic. But equally, ideas on the left of public ownership that would once have been considered unthinkable are now being promoted even by the Conservative parties. We've seen Malcolm Turnbull say he's going to build a, a new hydro plant, then maybe a coal-fired power plant. Uh, we've, we've seen, indeed, uh, the complete abandonment of the neoliberal orthodoxy uh, whenever it's proved politically convenient. Uh, there is room to, to move. We've seen this, of course, uh, in, uh, for example, uh, after Brexit, we had uh, Jeremy Cor Corbyn nearly winning office with the slogan, for the many, not the few, something we would never have heard from the likes of Tony Blair or, or indeed um, any of the Labor leaders of the, of, uh, in Australia over the past, past decade or two. The time is right, I think, for a reassertion of a new New Deal and new social democracy. Thank you.